you are now visiting the uh, speaker series of the Resistance Studies Initiative. This is our third uh, visiting speaker this fall. And uh, we will have three more coming up. And the uh, next one is going to be Lori Dance that will speak on October 17, 4 to 6. But then it happens in Commonwealth Honors College, their event school. Uh, her title, I think it's fascinating, it's an educator, an activist, and a sociologist walk into a box. Dot, dot, dot. So the talk is about comedy uh, humor uh, in the work against racism. Um, so um, that will be on this October 17, and there will be other things happening. If you check our website, you will find uh, information about the other things uh, going on. Um, I'm very happy to have the honor to uh, introduce Professor Richard Jackson from University of Otago, mm -hmm. um, who will speak about pacifism as a resistance against the um, existing hegemony uh, within international relations field. So Richard has been, over the last decade, uh, worked, he's been working very much in the field of uh, critical studies on terrorism. So that has already been a previous intervention into the academic field of terrorism studies. Terrorism studies is, that is very much uh, a field that is mainstream and not particularly critical, was then feeling the influence of this critical perspective of um, uh, critical studies. Um, and you also created a journal around that. So this is like an, an interesting uh, possibility for us to learn what is Richard's plans and thinking when it comes to the intervention of pacifism into international relations. So welcome and thank you for being here. Sheet as well. If you want to get uh, information or mailings about what's happening and so on, please sign up. So, thank you for having me. Sincere, sincere thanks to uh, Stellan and Debbie for uh, arranging this talk um, on pacifism as a form of discursive resistance in international relations and I apologize but I'm I'm going to kind of read the paper a bit just because I want to make sure that I'm getting the arguments across as clearly as possible. Now the argument that I want to make today uh, comes first of all from the standpoint of my own personal commitment to pacifism which in turn came out of my experience of war in southern Zambia at the time of the Zimbabwean War of Independence uh, in the 1970s. I, I was born there and I grew up there. Uh, and then later on, my professional research into the nature of war and political violence convinced me that, that pacifism uh, was um, a legitimate and intellectually defensible uh, position to, to have. So living in Zambia at the time of this war, I had a small experience of war violence, and that was enough to confirm Elaine Scarry's argument that in its material expression, violence is always a world-shattering and deeply traumatizing experience. And in many ways, it also confirms what all ethical theories acknowledge, including just war theory, which is the dominant ethical theory in international relations, that war is a profound moral and political evil. Second, the argument that I want to make comes out of the research that I've done, which uh, Stellan just mentioned over the past 10 years on the discourses and practices of the war on terror, which have convinced me that organized violence or military force is an ineffective and unethical tool for creating security, peace, or indeed any other imaginable political good. It, it can create political bads, such as repression, mistrust, hostility, and so on, 
but I would argue that it's very ineffective at producing political goods. Lastly, the argument that I want to make comes from a project I'm currently doing on the subjugation of pacifist theory and practice within the field of international relations. And here I would like to acknowledge the Marsden Fund in New Zealand for the grant that's enabled my research and the University of Otago for funding my sabbatical, which has allowed me to come here and visit with you. So before I go any further, I need to explain that I use the terms pacifism and nonviolence interchangeably. Uh, and I define pacifism broadly as a negative opposition to war and organized forms of violence, as well as a positive commitment to nonviolent forms of politics. Or, as your own Stellan Windhagen defines it, it's political action which is directed against, against violence without violence. In other words, properly understood, as Stellan argued, nonviolence has a normative principled content which makes it a form of pacifism broadly conceived in my view. Now there's no question that pacifism is a kind of subjugated knowledge as Michel Foucault describes it with, within IR and the broader culture. Uh, we can observe its subjugation in the way that pacifist theory and practice is excluded from public, political, and academic discussions about the use of force and war in international politics. Uh, in cases such as the vociferous criticism of Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party in Britain, for being a pacifist, um, and the assertion that, that came out at that time that because he was a pacifist, this made him unfit for holding political office. Uh, it also comes out in the militarization of popular culture, in education and academia. Uh, you've never seen a course in pacifism at a university. And in the broader discourse or truth regime that we have in society. And this cultural, political, and academic subjugation and suppression of pacifism and nonviolence occurs in a number of different ways. First of all, it, it occurs through the strategy of what we would call silencing, which means that it's simply not discussed. It's not paid any attention to. If we have discussions or do research, teaching, or other academic activities, we never mention. I've done research on the number theory or, or terms related to pacifism such as Gandhi, um, nonviolence and so on are mentioned in national relations journals, in their textbooks and in their conferences. Uh, and this confirms what Dustin Howes, who wrote a terrific book called Towards a Credible Pacifism, uh, argued that, and I quote, there have only been a handful of articles devoted to discussing pacifism in all of the major generalist political science journals combined in the United States over the last 40 years. Despite the fact that it deals with the use of force, politics, violence, war, and so on, it is really uh, discussed or engaged with at the academic level, as the uh, foe would say. The second strategy occurs through the deployment of a whole set of commonly expressed narratives, analogies, and objectives. So my research, as well as that of other people, suggests that there are some key narratives and, and objections to pacifism that you will find whenever it is discussed in any case. And, that, and that's very rarely that it is. But when it is, you will hear these uh, terms. And you'll you'll Oh, sorry, these uh, narratives. And you'll see them in academic text, in academic speech, in textbooks, in political speeches, in everyday conversation. Try to talk to someone, a friend, a relative, and you know something about prison and about So, for example, it's often a when pacifism is discussed, that pacifism is a single absolute moral position, which rejects any and all force and violence, 
therefore rules it out as a moral resource for thinking about the challenge of violence. You'll hear pacifism, which is sometimes called passive resistance, involves specific that entails doing nothing in the face of violence. Another narrative is that pacifism is inconsistent because if an attacker threatened their family, they would engage in self-defense, but they may choose to extend the same. The individual attacker analogy, and often people will say, your partner, you will Another narrative, pacifism is naive and unrealistic. The affectability of human nature and the nature of evil. They cannot contribute to this very deal. Pacifism, while an admirable personal quality, is not a politics with life, and therefore no leader could be a common narrative that we sometimes hear, we hear about, uh, is that pacifism actually in the face of the world or wielded by an unfortunate foe. Nonviolence has worked in the past, but only because it was deployed against democratic countries. Probably the most famous, commonly used objection to pacifism is the argument that the historical experience of Hitler and the Nazis proves that nonviolence is hopelessly naive and unrealistic. And military force is the only way to stop some uh, wrongdoings. And then lastly, pacifism is dangerous because it signals weakness and thereby encourages aggression. So these are the common narratives and analogies that are used to try and denigrate and sub, uh, dismiss the relevance of pacifism. In contrast, the dominant discourse in politics and also international relations and society more broadly follows Max Weber's assertion in his famous uh, essay, Politics as a Vocation, that, and I quote, decisive means for politics is violent. Quite different political tasks of politics fails to see this is indeed a political infant. And as a consequence, pacifism is also sub subjugated through a final strategy, and that is of shame, whereby those accused of being pacifist are belittled and mocked for being naive, idealistic, infantile, and so on. Um, in many cases, this leads to a kind of self set um, so that people who are actually pacifists won't admit it in public for fear of being mocked and shamed. Uh, that's why most of you will never have met a self-proclaimed pacifist. Um, apart from me, I'm a self-proclaimed pacifist. So, what are the consequences of the subject of pacifism? I don't have time to go into a, a lot of details here. A number of identifiable consequences which flow from this deep and widespread subjugation of pacifism and nonviolence. Uh, these include, amongst many others, uh, the ways in which the subjugation of pacifism functions to limit the ethical and political possibilities for acting in response to security threats, risks, and dangers in the world. Because pacifism is subjugated and dismissed, it has little or no impact on security thinking or security practices in international politics. Uh, this means that for the most part, violent force-based options are the default response for most states. And, and non-violent creative solutions and alternatives are completely ignored. I mean, this is why we're in a kind of groundhog day when it comes to uh, terrorist violence that we think emanates from the Middle East in relation to ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so on. Every time there's an attack, the only thing we can think of, political leaders can think of, is to increase the level of bombing against ISIS or 
expand the military operations. More broadly, the subjugation of pacifism functions as a key discursive process in the perpetuation of militarism and global violence, or what the moral philosopher Duane Cady calls warism. That is, the rejection of pacifism is a central plank in the ideological system which normalizes war and militarism and its uh, associated violences. It's part of the underlying beliefs and ideas and narratives and discourses which make violence normal and legitimate in our society. Now this means that for activists, citizens and scholars concerned about moving towards a more peaceful and just world, there's a practical and ethical imperative to resist the subjugation of pacifism. Until the dominant discourse of militarism, the everyday common sense beliefs and ideas about the justifiable use of violence, and the naivety and disutility of pacifism, until those beliefs are delegitimized and deconstructed, it's going to be much harder to dismantle all the other institutional, economic, and material structures which support war and violence uh, in political life. So the question, therefore, is how exactly do we discursively resist the subjugation of pacifism and the normalization of militarism? How do we forcefully take the argument to the proponents of violence? How do we resist the dominant ideology and practice of warism? And I want to suggest in this talk three main discursive strategies that we can use particularly in terms of being scholars uh, interested in international relations. The first strategy is to respond to the critics. Uh, and there isn't time here to respond to all of those narratives that I mentioned. But what I can do is give you a flavor of the kinds of responses we can make to people who criticize pacifism and say that it's, in particular, it's naive and uh, uh, not considering. For example, in the first case, it's relatively straightforward to demonstrate that rather than being a single moral absolute position, pacifism is on a continuum of different ethical and political positions in relation to war, violence, and politics. And this extends from what we might call absolute pacifism at one end to collectivist pacifism, epistemological pacifism, technological pacifism, nuclear pacifism, environmental pacifism, pragmatic pacifism, uh, and then at the other end of the scale, things like just war. So it's a scale. And there are many types of pacifists, as there are types of feminists or environmentalists or anarchists and so on. Similarly, it's quite easy to argue that pacifism is far from passive as the real-world examples of Gandhi, King, and countless other nonviolent resist resistance movements have demonstrated historically, and I'm sure you know a lot about a lot of them. The reality is that pacifists do not claim that it is wrong to resist violence. On the contrary, they claim that violence should be resisted. They just believe that there are strong moral, and I would argue practical grounds, for preferring to do so nonviolently. In fact, pacifists argue that, to quote Gandhi, pacifism does not seek meek submission. It means pitting one's whole soul against the will of the tyrant. And then to the argument that pacifism doesn't work in the real world, Duane K suggests that, and I quote, when faced with the objection, it won't work, it won't work, the pacifist response must be simply that nonviolent action does work has a history to document the claim. Interestingly, you can make an alternative argument here with the, um, again, with the ethicist uh, uh, Robert Holmes, who, who said, and I quote, we simply do not know whether there is a viable practical alternative to violence and will not and cannot know unless we are willing to make an effort comparable to the multi-billion dollar a year effort currently made to produce means of destruction and train young people in their use to explore the potential of nonviolent action. He goes on to argue, no one can foresee what the results might be if a country like the United States were to spend $300 billion a year 
in research on techniques of nonviolent resistance and on educating and training young people in their use. In other words, until we, until we do an experiment where we put the same effort that we currently put into the military as we do into nonviolence, we can't know for certain which one would work uh, most effectively. But I think I can guess. And I think most of you can guess as well. Finally, uh, in this section, on re in responding to these different narratives, uh, the response to the Nazi analogy, which is commonly, the mo probably the most common, commonly deployed argument to dismiss pacifism and nonviolence, there are a number of possible responses. Uh, first of all, as Robert Holmes again reminds us, and I quote, we should remember that there need be no inconsistency in holding that the war against Nazi Germany was justified. Wars today are fought under different circumstances, with different weapons, by different actors, and under the constant of nuclear weapons. And there are nonviolent mechanisms and options for dealing with international threats that were not available in 1939. Another possible argument is to recognize the temporal aspects of the argument and the way in which the analogy is most often framed. That is, it's always framed at one particular moment in the development of Nazi power. To quote Robert Holmes again, have pushed back German armor on the battlefield once the institutions of militarism had been allowed to mature and the self-propelling mechanism of a military state had been put into motion, it might have been effective at an earlier stage in preventing the rise to power of those responsible. If the historical fact is that military means stopped Hitler once he began to march, it is also an historical fact that reliance upon such means on the part of the world's nations did not prevent his rise to power in the first place. And had military action not been taken, say, until 1943, or if Germany had perfected the atom bomb first, it is unlikely that Hitler could have been stopped this way either." End quote. In other words, it depends on the point. You argue that uh, pacifism and nonviolence may or may not have worked. Lastly, and this is the point uh, that's, that's important here, it can be argued without contradiction that there will always be cases where nonviolence cannot succeed just as there will always be cases where violence cannot succeed either. Certainly there are always going to be circumstances where nonviolence or violence will not succeed immediately, but it might work. Struggle. The point here is that all the common objections So that's the first strategy, to, to respond to the critics of pacifism. The second strategy of discursive resistance involves forcefully challenging the widespread, but what is naive and most unexamined reliance and acceptance of violence in IR. In other words, we need to make and mount a strong critique of violence uh, in order to make our case. Now, our first step here is to highlight the findings of people like Dustin Howes, who notes that, and I quote, there is gathering evidence for the ineffectiveness of violence in a variety of empirical literatures. In other words, there's a, there's a growing number of studies that we now have which show how ineffective violence is. And I'll just give you a few examples here. There are, there are studies, for example, which show that states with greater material ca capabilities, greater military capabilities, are no more likely to win wars than those with weaker military capabilities. But also, there are growing studies which show that the states with the most greatest military capabilities are actually winning wars a lot less often these days than they have done in the past. There are also studies which show how ineffective air power campaigns are in achieving political results. There are also studies which show that violent state repression of popular protest usually doesn't work 
and instead most often provokes more protests. There are studies which show that the death penalty does not work to deter crime. There are studies which show how previous bouts of political violence becomes a predictor of future bouts of political violence. In other words, political violence tends not to produce peace, but it tends to produce more violence. There are studies which question the effectiveness of torture. Studies which question whether drone killings reduce terrorism. And there are empirical studies which show that both terrorism and violent forms of counterterrorism are mostly ineffective. In other words, there's a whole growing body of research which shows that violence uh, is mostly ineffective in achieving uh, the main goals that it, it attempts to do. However, in my view, we only have to contemplate the historical record of military violence in Korea, Vietnam, Lebanon, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Pakistan, etc., etc., to see how seldom large scale political violence works, how unpredictable are its consequences, and how the application of increasing force and the achievement of success, whether that's strategic or normative, bears no direct relationship to each other. I mean, this is no more so the case than with the ongoing war on terror. It has resulted in over a million deaths so far, the widespread use and spread of torture, rendition, and extensive human rights violations, and the spread of instability and insecurity across many regions. That's without any discernible increase in security or success in preventing future terrorist attacks. In a sense, if violence Think about how many wars there are. Violence actually worked to create peace and security. I think we would have it already. In the end, rejecting Max Weber's view that a, a realistic understanding of politics requires embracing violence. And in, di in direct contrast, Dustin Howe suggests that, and I quote, the weight of extensive empirical evidence demonstrates that the practitioners of violence are more often the tragic idealists. Nonviolence grapples more effectively with the frustrating, difficult, and unpredictable of politics. Now, what's important here is that this kind of empirical snapshot failure of, of violence can be explained theoretically, and it can be explained uh, by noting how and how the effectiveness of violence Entirely on how people respond to the violence, not the violence itself. In other words, the capacity to kill and destroy bears no direct relation to the ability to coerce. In the real world, the application of violence can provoke either deterrence or retaliation, intimidation or rage, submission or resistance, and the desired response can never be. I mean, if you use violence against the people, sometimes those people will submit to your will, other times they will rise up and uh, respond in kind. You can't predict. In other words, violence has no predictable effect on the response that you're trying to get. I mean, this is why proponents of violence often mistake the reliability of violence as a political tool. Again, quoting Dustin Howes, who quotes Arendt, Arendt's theory of action demonstrates that violence is not as reliable as is often assumed. Killing people does not have predictable political results because it operates in a somewhat intangible web of human relations which makes it difficult to know what means people will assign to it or what actions they will take in response to it. So that's your own Stalin Vintage. 
explains how power and violence are analytically distinct. Given that violence operates, violence involves unilateral action, whereas power is by definition relational, and it operates through the approval of the subordinate. So even in the in context, to a relation. So Stalin goes on to suggest that as a consequence, and I quote, the most extreme result of the killing of a human being is something that ensures that there will never again be subordination within that relationship. Killing results in an absolute sin. In fact, violence is a failure of power, end quote. More generally, well, I mean, this, this, all, what all this says is that the proponents of violence have misunderstood how violence actually functions and what it can actually do. The fact that you don't need violence to, to, to have power. You don't need violence to coerce. Uh, violence is not commensurate or equal to or the same as coerce to a and yet, to be able to get other people to do what we want them to do and achieve. But that misunderstands the nature of the relationship between violence and power and coercion. In addition to this, pacifist theory points from misunderstood formative, message-sending aspects of violence. In particular, how it requires broader discourse to make it both possible in the first place and meaningful to its perpetrators and its audiences. In part, this is because, as Elaine Scarry so eloquently describes, in its material aspect, violence is dehumanizing and world-shattering, and it requires, therefore, tremendous discursive effort to legitimize, obscure, or aestheticize its brutal characteristics, and instead highlight its positive, redemptive features. And what I mean by this is that when a bomb, for example, uh, tears apart the body of a young child, in that moment, all the legitimations of violence disappear, and there's nothing but horror, there's nothing but pain. And so, in order to make that act meaningful again and acceptable and to take the horror out of it, we have to come up with a whole massive amount of discourse which puts it into the context of just war theory or a collateral damage or unintentionality. Or we have to aestheticize it, which is what we do with movies make violence cool. We've got to make it seem pretty uh, and, and aesthetic, right? So that it's in slow motion and that uh, the hero can survive a bullet and fight back. And all those, pra all those practices, discursive practices, are designed to kind of overcome the brute horror of what violence actually is. And from this perspective, the use of violence as a political tool reconstructs the discursive context in which violence becomes possible in the first place. In other words, employing violence in the name of countering violence primarily functions to reinforce the initial reasons for which violence is legitimately employed as a tool of politics. The deliberate use of violence constitutes the conditions for its own practice. Thus, when proponents of humanitarian intervention, for example, argue that we should use violence to protect people, the message of that action says it's legitimate to use violence against those who use violence. I mean, you can see that the only result of that is the situation of the use of violence as a tool of politics in the future. However, the most important point here in our argument against violence is that in keeping basic and widely accepted social theory, violence is never purely instrumental. It is not, 
and cannot be a political tool. Rather, it is constitutive of identities, ethics, and practices. At the very least, we could say, it constitutes society through the institutionalization of the war system and the normalization of violence at the heart of politics. In other words, if you're going to say, this is a country which is a tool, it's not going to be just a tool, because in order to use it as a tool, you have to have a military that needs an economic base, supplies, it needs science and technology to develop the weapons, it needs a system of manufacturing, and then it also needs an ideological system that accepts war, that accepts killing of others and so on. So you've got to have a cultural context and a cultural structure as well as a material structure. And that is part of the constitution of your society. So you can't just use it as a tool that you pick up, use, and then put down. It, has, it becomes part of the fabric of the culture and society that you're in. I mean, at the same time, and more broadly, the use of violence is constitutive of identities, of friend and enemy, self and other, uh, through the construction of violence legitimizing discourses. In fact, as Fraser and Hutchings put it, the idea that violence can be employed instrumentally as a tool, and I quote, misses the link between violence and doing being, especially when we take into account that our bodies themselves are prime instruments of violence. They conclude, and I quote, that violence is not actually very much like a tool at all. To sum up at this point then, discursive resistance in international relations the critique of violence and the idealistic naive view that it can be used for positive or even level. A realistic assessment of violence shows that while it can achieve immediate things like dead bodies, screams, pain, suffering, and material destruction, and while it can sometimes achieve certain short-term goals, uh, like destruction of enemies means to fight, its longer-term effects are by virtue of its constitutive and world-shattering nature, unpredictable, and virtually always ends destroying. And here, I want to suggest that we should heed Gandhi, who said, and I quote, I object to violence because when it appears to do good, the good is only temporary. The evil it does is permanent. Similarly, Hannah Arendt argued that, and I quote, the practice of violence, like all action, changes the world. But the most probable change is to a more violent world. Practice it time, creating the conditions for it. So we can take this violence right to the heart of the and suggest that they have a naive and simplistic and unrealistic view of this tool that they think they're using. That's strategy. Strategy. Strategy three defend the view that pacifism and nonviolence offers a more practical ethical basis for thinking of ethics and security. So this argument can be made, first of all, I think, by noting that pacifism offers an alternative mode and practice of ethical theorizing. I'm not sure how familiar you are with just war theory and the kind of normative theorizing that goes on in a lot of international relations. In contrast to, to that kind of theorizing, which mostly employs abstractions and scenario-based reasoning and thought experiments, um, pacifism starts with the anthropology of human conflict, the reality of violence experienced in the bodies of human beings, and the history of human relations and political struggle. So this provides pacifist ethics with a grounded reality that's often missing from most just war theorizing and IR accounts of ethics. Second, in contrast to just war theory and realist approaches, which are rooted in the values of security, 
protection through force, the state as the ultimate community, and so on. Pacifism instead offers an ethics based on alternative values of the dignity and equality of others, humility and the recognition of human fallibility, and most profoundly, the principle of treating people as means, not ends. In other words, rooted in Kant's second formulation of the categor categorical imperative, which is, and I quote, act so that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always as an end and never as a means only, and recognizing that to kill others is to promote your own ends, Consequent need to reverse course and recognizing that human understanding of the truth will always be partial. Pacifist ethics recognizes the problematic nature of violence. Robert Holmes again suggests that. So you've got to be completely infallible of what you're doing when you use violence. Dustin Howes makes a similar point. He says, violence makes it difficult to reverse course one's mistakes. And even when it when it's temporarily conception of means ends consistency we try to separate means and ends the results we achieve are extensions of the policies we live means and ends are aspects of one and the same event I get this point by suggesting the belief that separate means and ends would be the same as thinking and I quote that we can get a rose through planting a noxious weed he goes on to say and I quote the means may be likened to a seed, the tree, and just as there is and and there is just the same inviolable connection between the means and the ends as there is between the seed and the tree. We reap exactly what we sow. From this perspective, it's in fact implausible to think that peaceful ends, such as security or democracy, the creation of non-warring communities can be achieved by violent, harmful ends. Just as it's implausible to think that trust can be built by deception, that love can be ge generated by fear, or, like the old peace movement used to say, that virginity could be made by sexual intercourse. Added to this, in broader ethico-political terms, uh, Molly Wallace, who wrote that book, As she explains it, the fact that violence ends the otherness that is another human life radically abrogates our responsibility to that other and prevents them from challenging the truth or justice of our political project, or indeed our one-dimensional characterization of them as terrorists, fanatics, barbarians, or whatever label we've used to dehumanize and demonize them in order to be able to kill them. So in contrast to that, Pacifism and nonviolence remain open to revision in a way that violent action should never be. And with experimentation, humility, and acknowledging mistakes is inherent to a normative, dialogic, emancipatory 
and peaceful form of politics. In fact, following one strand of political theory, it can be argued that violence is the opposite of politics. It is politics constitutive outside. It sets the limits of politics. Violence begins where politics ends. In part, this is because the essential characteristics of violence, if we look closely and honestly at it, are the opposite or the negation of the essential characteristics of politics. So, for example, violence negates dialogue, while politics is a form of dialogue. Violence ends relationships, while politics is inherently relational. Violence destroys bodily integrity, the equality of persons, and human dignity, while politics seeks to maintain the integrity, equality, and dignity of others. Violence treats people as a means to an end, while politics treats people as ends in themselves. Violence is certain, final, and irreversible, while politics is open-ended, experimental, and provides for reconsideration and reversibility. Violence involves domination and rule, while politics involves participation and engagement. Violence is centralizing and elitist, while politics is democratizing and participatory, etc., etc. As Fraser and Hutchings summarize it, and I quote, regardless of whether violence may have its uses and justifications in relation to politics, the crucial point is that it should never be conflated with politics itself. Politics is conceptually and theoretically distinct from violence, end quote. It's for this that growing number of scholars are beginning to articulate a Gandhian form of political theory which has radical nonviolence or pacifism at its center, uh, recognizing that difference and complex of the human condition, opponents of, of what uh, Karuna Mantena called Gandhian realism argue that only a kind of politics based on complete and total nonviolence can avoid violence or as Stanley Howarass, who was reflecting on the events of 9-11, expressed it, and I quote, nonviolence is the necessary condition for a politics not based on death. In the end, I think we can argue against the dominant um, perspective in IR that as Todd May concludes, and I quote, while we cannot make sweeping claims about the necessary superiority of nonviolence, we can say that nonviolence is morally superior to violence. And we should privilege nonviolence as the moral default in cases of resistance. Where resistance against oppression or other social e ills has become necessary, nonviolence should prevail as the morally required course of action. So those are my three strategies for engaging with international relations. Uh, answering the objections to pacifism, challenging them on the nature of violence, and then arguing for the moral and ethical and practical superiority of nonviolence. Now I want to conclude my talk by acknowledging, acknowledging what I know some of you, if not many of you, are thinking. Despite all these reasonable arguments and evidence that I have presented here, it seems nonetheless incredibly idealistic to think that pacifism and nonviolence could ever gain a wider acceptance and become part of our politics, our foreign policy, and our culture. I mean, after all, militaristic thinking, institutions, in our ways of thinking, our entertainment, our universities and our churches, and there are a great many vested interests in maintaining the war system. There are too many people and too many corporations and too many institutions making too much money and getting too much capital from war and violence for them to give it up without serious and sustained opposition. But I want to end by suggesting that there are a number of reasons for maintaining a sense of optimism about this. The most obvious and profound reason for optimism is, as Kenneth Balding put it, and I quote, anything that exists is possible. I mean, just think about that for a second. 
Anything that exists is possible. We know that peaceful, non-warring societies exist, and they have existed for thousands of years. Anthropologists have documented at least 74 of them. Therefore, peaceful, non-warring societies are possible. We know that peaceful, non-warring regions of the world exist, like the Scandinavia, the European Union, places where for thousands of years they had war, but war is now impossible. Therefore, a peaceful, non-warring world is possible. We know that countries exist which have disbanded them and integrated unarmed civilian resistance into their national defense systems. Therefore, getting rid of the military and adopting unarmed forms of defense is possible. We know that nonviolent resistance movements exist, which have overthrown brutal repressive regimes, won independence, and changed unjust laws without the use of violence. Therefore, making political change, including against dictators, is possible without violence. We know that groups and organizations exist which have, which have successfully protected innocent people without violence in the middle of brutal civil wars. I mean, just look up what groups like um, Brigades International are doing in places like South Sudan. Keeping this possible. We know that communities exist in places like Syria and Colombia which have non-violently resisted terrorist groups and other unarmed actors and created zones of relative peace and safety without the use of violence. Therefore, it is possible to create security without violence. I could go on and on. The point is that when you evaluate all the evidence and arguments, it's not at all unrealistic or naive to think that pacifism could work to provide security, protect the innocent, win political concessions and be at the heart of a new political project. There's no need for, for pessimism about pacifism. In fact, it's the proponents of violence who ought to be pessimistic, as all their efforts to create peace and security have so far failed. If war and military violence really lead to peace, I'm saying this again, then we would have it already. After two world wars, and more than 300 wars since 1945, we would have a lot of peace. No. Secondly, I would argue that pacifism and violence itself provides reasons for optimism because it's rooted in the theory, which is backed up by history, of the human capacity. It's based on the verifiable observation that human beings have the capacity to act change their own circumstances. That human beings are agents of history, not simply the subjects of history. That's at the root of pacifism. And then finally, I'm optimistic because I sense a broader global war weariness with the violent militaristic war status quo. I think there's a hunger out there for more ethical, practical alternatives to the violent neoliberal order we're currently oppressed by. Pacifism offers a radical, I mean, I would argue a revolutionary alternative to current political philosophy and practice. This is because pacifism revolutionizes both the means and the ends of politics, and because it provides a robust basis for the broader project of resistance to all forms of violence, direct, structural, cultural, and epistemic. Pacifism challenges the authority and sovereignty of the state as an institution and rejects the state's, moral, the, the state's status as a moral actor with a right to kill and compel its citizens to kill. Moreover, pacifism, rooted in a normative commitment to emancipation and positive peace, deconstructs and challenges the myth of violence as power. And in that way, it dismantles the state's monopoly on force and empower citizens to act autonomously. In other words, in the final analysis, I think we have both the evidence and the argument to effectively resist the warism and militarism that currently dominate relations in our wider society. And I would argue that now is the perfect moment 
and I get to struggle. I hope you will join me. Uh, Stellan, who are also struggling uh, for this most important task. So thank you for listening.